Broadcasting from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia to around the globe. You're listening to Shark Bite Biz, your exclusive place for business strategy, sales, marketing, and tech in the roaring 20s. And now, here's your host, David Strausser. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm your glamorous host, David Strausser. Welcome to the newest episode of Shark Bite Biz, your place to grow a business during complete chaos. We got an amazing episode slated for you all today. Money is tight for everybody, and we're going to bring some new ideas to the forefront today. First, though, remember, if you're watching us on YouTube, you can join the channel and become a baby shark for only $3 a month. Now, if giving money through big tech isn't your thing, we get you, you're out there, you can go to deadhousecoffee.com, use code SHARK, yeah, you get 20% off, and all proceeds go directly supporting to us at this channel, building the best, biggest show that we possibly can. Now, let's get back to today's show. This episode is all about finances and investment. We're going to talk about tax-deferred growth, asset protection, how to grow regardless of economic or market conditions, and what I think is probably the most unique, the, the most freshest concept I've heard in a long, long time, how to bank on yourself. Yeah, you heard that right. How to bank on yourself. Sounds totally intriguing, right? So who is today's guest? Oh, so glad you asked. Sari Ibrahim. Sari Ibrahim is a financial planner and member of the Bank on Yourself organization. He helps real estate investors, business owners, and full-time employees grow safe and predictable wealth, regardless of market conditions using a financial strategy that has been around for over 160 years. Sari started this journey when he was in grad school completing his MBA. He worked for companies like Allstate, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Cigna Health Spring, and Humana before founding Financial Asset Protection, a financial services firm that focuses on one sole concept, the bank on yourself concept, which is also known as the infinite banking concept. So, hey, I'm going to shut up now. Let's bring Sari on in here. Business strategy. Sari, welcome to Shark Bite Biz. You, my friend, you just became Shark Bait. Hey, David, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem. No problem at all, man. So we have a tradition on the show. Very first question. It's a softball, lob, really easy question. You know, tell us about your experience, your background. What the heck do you do? Basically, Tell everybody what makes Sari Sari. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so right now what I'm doing is I run a company called Financial Asset Protection. It's mm-hmm. a financial services firm located in Chicago, Illinois, and we help and service clients in all 50 states. We do this pretty much obviously over the phone or over Zoom. But it's more of a, a virtual approach to helping clients with financial situations. And we do this mostly from a conservative, uh, safe money approach. We don't invest, it, we don't uh, advise clients to invest in the stock market. We don't take unnecessary risks. We're more of, we advise clients on saving strategies. That's who we are and what we do. Obviously, it didn't start off this way. I wasn't always a, a financial planner. Uh, before this, I used to work for a couple, uh, I, I was in the healthcare industry and I worked for a couple in, uh, health insurance companies. And I was a Medicare consultant helping people who were retiring and, and I was helping them with their insurance plans. And during that time, one of my clients asked me if I could help him with uh, life insurance mm-hmm. and uh, other financial solutions. And I was like, hey, you know what? This sounds like a good idea. And I already had the trust with the client. So I just told the client, like, I'm not really sure how this works, but let me just do some research and I'll get back to you. Mm-hmm. And I went to Amazon and I just searched for books on life insurance. And I came across <laughs> one book called uh, The Bank on Yourself Revolution by Pamela Yellen. And then that book kind of led me to building my financial practice now. So this is who we are, what we do. And I'm glad to be on your show to talk about this concept and how we yeah. can help business owners kind of retain more capital throughout their journey. Wow, that's a story about and stats if I've ever heard one. That's pretty cool. But I mean, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me because I'm not in the industry, but I do view that there's a lot of synergy between 
financial services and insurance services. Mm -hmm. So I would think that that's not too difficult of a transition learning curve. How was it for you? Yeah, so you're right. So there are a lot of similarities. Uh, for example, with the licensing, like life and health insurance. So typically, a lot of financial planners have their life insurance license and sometimes their health. And then a lot of, obviously, on the health insurance side, it's, it's your health insurance license. There's a lot of uh, overlapping material between those two. And then even when you go on the industry, a lot of financial planners will have some, like they might do like health insurance benefits and like Medicare benefits within their financial practice. So there's similarities, but there's also differences too. Uh, for example, when you meet with um, a client, for example, with Medicare, you might do the intro, the analysis, the solution, and the application all in one meeting. You, you meet with the right. client, Mr. Mm -hmm. Client, Mrs. Client, what is your situation? What's your retiring in three months? All right, perfect. We could do this solution because of what you mentioned. They signed the application and the, everything happened in one hour and one meeting. Whereas on the financial planning side, it's 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 the opposite of that. You meet with somebody for an right. hour, you talk for an hour, getting to know each other, you meet again, you do a full 60 mm -hmm. to 90 minute financial analysis, getting to another, getting to another understanding, the situation. You come back for a third meeting, you present the entire solution to them, and then they might think about it for a month and then you come back again and then close the application. And then it goes through underwriting for four to six weeks later. And mm -hmm. then they might approve or might need a few more months to delay. And then after that, they start funding it. And then after that, you're doing six month reviews with the client. So definitely a much longer process on the financial yeah. planning side, because there's a lot more that goes into it than just, you know, a health insurance plan. Right. All right. With the financial planning, I mean, with what you're doing, then do you have to be registered with your your state to do what you're doing so yeah so yeah there's, there's there's a lot of rules and laws about it since we are mostly on the fixed product side meaning we're dealing with mostly fixed insurance or fixed annuities the only licensing we need are uh, life and health insurance licenses in our state and each state that we we work in so you're registered in 50 states essentially no, that's required so so, um, so okay. we, right now we're registered in about 25 states, but what happens is if I come across, for example, mm -hmm. like I'm working actually with a client right now in Pennsylvania. And yeah, not in Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and so, not the client. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what we're doing now is I just applied for the license. So the license uh -huh. typically takes about three to four business days. So I get the application from the client, apply for the license once that gets approved. So I can do this for any state pretty much instead of me going out and just getting licensed in different states. I can wait until I can have a client, talk to the client once we're kind of serious. Do it as needed. needed. Do it as needed. Exactly. Correct. Yeah, I know Pennsylvania is pretty backed up with mm -hmm. all their mm -hmm. licensing. I have friends from beauty salons uh -huh. to, for example, uh, a lot of our viewers on the show know that I just recently incorporated this with our coffee brand as well, mm -hmm. too. So Shark Bite Biz and Dead House Coffee are now part of the corporate structure of Dead Brands LLC. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, I like zombies. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, Pennsylvania, the, the agency I used to do the paperwork, they were telling me like, yeah, really, really slow. Like mm -hmm. you're talking three to four weeks minimum in Pennsylvania. It's one of the slowest states that they work with. But also on the professional licensing side, I'm full of friends from, I guess, real estate agents, yeah. financial advisors, beauty people, people that just have like, uh, hey, I'm opening up a beauty slot. I need to have it registered with the state, those types of things to where it's taken that long they've actually had to get their state representatives involved to be like, hey, where the heck's this license at? Oh, wow. It's pretty rough right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and for all this, in all 50 states for insurance, they're all pretty much just an application you would apply for online. But Pennsylvania, they make you get your fingerprints and you have to go to like a certified place and then mail them to a biometric place. And then, so yeah, Pennsylvania does put some extra stuff. We got in when weird it, laws out here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you should see the alcohol laws if you think that's bad. <laughs> I mean, seriously, now thank God I think they're starting to modernize. That was the toughest part of me moving from Baja, California, Mexico, or oh, well. SoCal, living in San Diego and Los Angeles, uh, to moving to Pennsylvania was not being able to walk across the street to 7 Eleven. And buy, you know, wine or liquor. I don't know about liquor, but I know at least wine and beer where you can't really do that out here. Now you can in some places, but yeah, very, very old, old mm -hmm. fashioned out here. But whatever, you know, you get used to it, I guess. 
So mm-hmm. let, let's get, you know, one of the suggested topics you gave me when you gave me your, your bio here kind of really um, caught my eye. And I wanted to discuss that with you because I'm like, wow, this seems, uh, this seems perfect for this podcast. Mm-hmm. And it says bank on yourself concept. Mm-hmm. What is the bank on yourself concept? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So the bank on yourself concept is also known as the infinite banking concept. So they're both pretty similar. And they well, use... I don't know the infinite banking concept either. So <laughs> you're going to have to help me out. <laughs> okay. They both use um, the underlying asset for both of these. What, mm-hmm. What's commonly used is something called dividend paying whole life insurance. Okay. So people are always like, whoa, I thought we were talking about business. You know, what does it have to do with you know, life insurance? Um, and to kind of back up on life insurance, there's typically three types of life insurance. There's term, whole life, and universal. So term life insurance, to kind of give the audience more context, term life insurance has a set period of time. It has a start date and it has an un- un- date. So you might do a policy for like 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years. There's no equity or cash value in it. It's just straight life insurance. You get it. You use it. If you outlive that period, which 99% of the time happens, then you're, you're fine. The insurance company keeps the premiums and then you just walk away or you could renew it if you want to, or you can cancel. So it's kind of like renting a home. You just use it for that moment only. Whole life is a permanent form of insurance. You get it as a start date. And the only way it ends is if you pass away or you just cancel the policy. Mm-hmm. And the other difference is that there's equity in it. So it, as you're paying the premiums into the policy, not only are you buying life insurance, but you also have cash value or a savings account portion in it that's accumulating and earning interest and dividends over time and building up. And then the so like time. with that, I, I want to ask because my father uh, yeah. was like, um, forget what it was, but something happened. He was in a crunch and he's like, I'm just going to mm-hmm. cash in my life insurance policy. And I'm mm-hmm. like, how the heck do you, I've heard of things like reverse mortgages mm-hmm. and stuff like that for elderly people. But how do you cash in your life uh, insurance policy? Is that kind of, would he have a policy like you just explained? Yeah. That whole life? Yeah, he probably has a whole life insurance policy with cash value in it. And then the cash value in the policy can be accessed two ways. It could be, okay. uh, you can borrow against it. Like if you have, for example, $100,000 in cash value, you could typically borrow up to 90%. So the insurance company will give you a loan up to, in this situation, up to $90,000 without any credit checks, any collateral, except for the policy itself. That's the only collateral you need. So yeah, that's what probably what happened. And then the so it's kind of like, it's kind of like, for example, 401k Mm -hmm. uh you this is money that you have in there the accrued value that with the cares act you could take up to 100 percent of it apparently Mm -hmm. uh you could have called up taken a loan out for 100 percent you're and then you're paying interest on it but you're paying interest to yourself is that Mm -hmm. how that's set up yeah it's it's very similar to that so you have the policy you borrow against it so you're banking on yourself you're borrowing Mm -hmm. from yourself but what happens is something cool happens. This is something that banks have been doing and, and financial institutions have been doing for like over a thousand years. What they'll do is they have an account growing somewhere that's earning compound interest. And then anytime yeah. they need money, instead of taking out from that money and withdrawing and interrupting the future growth, they borrow against it from a different source, leveraging their cash reserves as collateral. This mm-hmm. is something that large corporations do, banks do, hedge funds. You know, they don't just tap into the reserves and withdraw from it and interrupt the growth of it. They borrow against it. And this is what we help clients do, even at a smaller level. You don't have to be a billionaire, even at a small level with, you know, just putting in $10,000 a year or five, whatever, however, we would come across the financial analysis um, and put, pretty much the ability to grow money and use it at the same time. Because so many people, especially <laughs> business owners, have this struggle of, do I save money? Do I pay down debt? Do I grow my business? Do I reinvest it? A lot of like, you know, what ifs and a lot of different scenarios for different business owners. But what if there's a way where you could grow your money, use that to pay down debt and mm-hmm. still save for retirement and reinvest in your business all at the same time? And that's possible when you have the ability to grow money and borrow against it, guaranteed borrow against it. So it's guaranteed. That's liquidity. pretty, that, that, that's pretty pretty awesome i just want to make sure that i'm following there because this this concept with you know what you're saying is a little bit new to me and i want to make sure i'm following as well as the listeners yeah so basically you're saying that unlike the situation where someone would borrow take money cash out of their life insurance or their 
uh, 401k, not cash out, but cash it out to take a loan and then they're repaying it back, is you're taking a loan on the value of it. So say they have $50,000 in their 401k or health or life insurance. Yeah. Instead of taking that 50K out, mm-hmm. they would actually take a loan from a third party using that 50K as the collateral. Is that kind of what you're saying? It's spot on, exactly. See, see, and people call me slow. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got it. Yeah, spot on, exactly. Yeah, it's, instead of subtracting from the balance and interrupting the growth, you borrow right. against it at a lower interest rate from a different source. Um, leveraging two things at once, kind of the growth and the liquidity at the same time. What kind of interest rates are you usually talking about then? And like, what kind of credit rating do you have to have? Considering you have the money there that's kind of guaranteed in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it something relatively easy? Do you have the perfect credit for that type of stuff? How does that all fit in? So you actually don't need any credit at all. It has nothing to do with credit. Um, I, I think on the it, somehow it could be based on your business and based on other financing mm-hmm. you have, but specifically with this product and this concept, it has nothing to do with credit. So you could, for example, um, you know, put in ten thousand dollars a year for twenty years, and over time, every dollar you're putting into the policy, a portion is going mm-hmm. towards servicing the life insurance, and another portion is going towards uh, the the cash value. So over time, you're going to build up cash value. Um, typically, it, it depends on how the policy is structured. Some policies break even in like year eight or year nine. This is where if you're putting in $10,000, you know, year eight, year nine, you have, you paid in $80,000 and you have about $80,000 in cash value. And then after that, the policy kind of outpaces what you're paying into it. So it depends on how it's structured, but pretty Mm -hmm. much as over time, you're building it up. And then at any time you want to borrow. So actually it's, there's two guarantees that happen. So one guarantee that happens is that the cash value will grow over time in a guaranteed contract with the insurance company. Right. That's one. And then the second guarantee is that you always have access to the policy via loan or withdrawal. Both of those are guaranteed as well. So you never have to qualify for a loan. You never have to uh, give up collateral, provide a credit history, credit score, a cosign or any of that stuff. When you apply for a loan, it's guaranteed liquidity, guaranteed loan provisions and the policy that you um, you are entitled to as the policy owner. And okay. you could pay back the loan whenever you want. It's not a set period of time where you could pay it back. You could pay it back over a year, 10 years, you know, however you want to pay it back. Obviously it's better to pay it back as soon as possible. So that way you can keep borrowing again over and over again. So think of it this way. Think of you have your, your business and then you have, you know, all of your expenses. You can have this policy in the middle of between the money you earn and the money you spend. So you could use, for example, revenue coming in from the business to pay for the policy and then on the back and borrow from the policy to pay your expenses and then do so over and over again. Some businesses have a few month delay in between paying, you know, their expenses. They might have like three months to pay their taxes. They might have, um, some time to pay for um, so some payroll expenses, bonuses, other things like that. They, there's some delays in there. They right. can park that money in the policy, borrow against it, use that. And then what happens when they do that is they grip the money that they between earning and spending it. It's a nice way to kind of add some barriers between the money you earn and the money you spend. Um, you get to it's, it's almost like having a net that you could kind of recoup more of it in the middle. This is just one example right. of using it within your business. Well, so one thing that I'm wondering there too is i mean we're talking like those whole life policies okay yeah. what is the main difference then between having something like a term life mm-hmm. policy and a whole life policy i mean which one's better because i mean for me personally mm-hmm. i just get the one we're offered for work and it's yeah. like okay you know i got a million dollars worth of coverage i guess that's term i don't know mm-hmm. group or whatever mm-hmm. um and it's like simple, you know, easy, um, you know, what's the benefits of that compared then to whole life? Like which one's better and why? Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, they're, they're different. So term is a set period of time. It's only mm-hmm. life insurance. So it might be, you know, 20 years, 30 years of just life insurance only. It's fairly cheap in comparison to what you pay to life insurance. And the reason why is like, for example, like, let's say somebody's 40 years old, a 40 year old male would get a term life policy, a million dollar payout, just kind of rough numbers. 
maybe it'd be like $50 a month. So you pay $50 a month for a million dollars in coverage. But the reason why that's that you get so much life insurance for the, that amount of money is because there's a nine, over a 99% chance the insurance company is not going to pay out, pay out on that claim. That means for 20 years, you're going to pay $50 a month for 20 years, and the insurance company is going to walk away with their premium dollars, and they're going to invest that money and then and earn that money. But I'm not saying term is a bad decision. Some people, it's a really good way to put it a filter. Like For example, if you're 40 years old and your goal is to retire or get closer to retire when you're 60, it's mm-hmm. a nice way to fill in that gap in case something happens to you during that time period. Now, the bank on yourself concept, it, even though it utilizes or to using whole life insurance, it's not a matter of whole life insurance. Rather, it's a matter of self-banking and cash flow. That's that's the main objective of it. So then okay. if I'm talking to a client and they're only fixed on life insurance, that's what they want to do. They want to protect their family. They want to protect their business in case something happens to them. And that's it. I would recommend term. I would write up the term life policy and that, that's it. But this concept introduces a new way of of utilizing cash. It's more of a self-baking purpose. Like one of the problems this concept addresses is the the, the problem of interest. Uh About for the average American, one third of every dollar earned earned goes to service debt. That means if somebody makes $100,000 a year, 33,000 on average goes to service debt. That's Uh auto loans, credit cards, mortgages, student loans, uh, personal debt, other types of debt goes to uh, service lenders. So in other words, you were working for the banks. Now the bank on yourself concept helps that it, it helps solve or mitigate that problem by churning the table, so that we were we're sitting on the other side of the table now, earning the interest back in our pocket instead of having that interest go to other lenders. We're able to recoup that. That's what the that's what the main core of the concept is about. It, does, it has different functions, different objectives for different people, mm-hmm. but the core of it is recouping the interest. So right. uh, to to kind of answer it, they're different, right? They have different purposes and different functions. Right. Term and whole life insurance. Sometimes we do both. Sometimes we do term and whole. Like the whole life for the cash value, the self-banking purposes to recoup that interest, the term for just the straight life insurance for a start period of time. Okay. Okay. So with that, one of the things that crossed my mind there is with, first off, like you give example, like with the term life insurance, it might be 50 bucks a month. With the mm-hmm. whole life, I mean, in comparison, like roughly, what would you be looking at for that same type of coverage? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so just to kind of take the cat out of the hat, you know, whole life insurance tends, if we're just focusing only on life insurance only, mm-hmm. it tends to be a lot more expensive than term, about five times the cost of Five term. times, wow. Yeah, but the problem is, again, it comes down to the purpose and the function of what we're doing. You know, it's not, you know, it's it's not so much about using life insurance. It's more about what what it's what is it going to do? And it comes out to the financial analysis. We gauge the clients. We understand where they want to go. And we talk about the retirement goals. We talk about uh-huh. their business. We talk about, you know, marketing strategies they're, they're implementing. And, and what's the end result? You know, what's the, what's the whole overall point of this? And typically, you know, for a lot of clients, it tends to be, you know, how do I take this money out of my business and then use that for retirement and for my family? You know, it, it's, it's the utilization of that actual cash from the business, not just the growth of the business itself, but uh-huh. actually taking that money out of the business and using it. And these strategies, the bank on yourself strategy, strategy typically helps them. Now, here's one thing to go back to term. I like that life. strategy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, here's, and here's one thing that connects term and whole life, or actually, in my opinion, could be whole life where you could be term, is that with mm-hmm. term, it's 100% sunk cost. That means for $50 a month or $100 a month, for 20 years, 90, over a 99% chance that money is going to the insurance company. And I guess it's a good thing, right? It's a, it's a good thing that you're not going to die, statistically speaking, within that 20-year time period. But it's a 100% sunk cost, meaning that you don't have the ability to recoup that money again. It, once, once you spend it, it's gone. Whereas whole life insurance is the opposite. Whole life insurance is a form of savings, and it's a way that eventually you get all that money back that you put into the policy, plus the interest and plus dividends. So you end up coming out ahead. Um, you recoup the cost. You, it's guaranteed that you're going to recoup the cost of, of what you spend on insurance with whole life insurance, sp- specifically designed the bank mm-hmm. on yourself way, because it has to be specifically designed. It's not this. Everything we're talking about here is not applicable to all insurance you know, companies in, across the whole country. Yeah, yeah. With term life, though, one question I did have. Uh, this is actually of a personal interest for me. My youngest brother passed away. I guess maybe three, four years ago. Um, he was twenty-five, uh, or actually no, he was twenty-six, and that's actually what caused the the issue. They de- they denied uh, paying his policy. So when they deny paying that, I mean. 
is do they have any type of obligation to repay back then all his payments or anything? How does that typically work? Yeah, so sorry, sorry, sorry to hear that. Um, ah, yeah, it is, it is what it is, you know, just move it on. It, it was hard, but that was, I think, one of the uh, the harder parts because what happened was, um, yeah, I don't, I'm pretty open as my uh, audience knows. You know, with him just turning 26, he had the same life insurance policy like his whole life. But with him mm -hmm. turning 26, he had to be spun off of, I guess, my father's policy mm -hmm. to his own personal policy, which was still up to date, paid for stuff like that. But because of that, uh, because of that change and him passing away when he was 26, they're like, oh, it's a new policy within two years. And they had to go back and investigate, I guess, within a, a month or two of his passing. They uh, discovered, oh, you lied, you were smoking. But he wasn't, he didn't actually start smoking again until like a month or two before he passed away when things were really starting to go downhill. Mm -hmm. But they used that for smoking to decline paying out his uh, life insurance, which literally stuck me with all the bills. And we never got a penny back. And I always thought that was uh, that was kind of wrong with the term life. Minimal, I thought they should have gave my, uh, you know, should have paid us back the amount mm -hmm. that he's been paying in for health insurance for his whole life for those 25 years. Yeah, yeah. D did you guys, because um, this is like a, like, a, like a technical legal issue, you know, did you guys ha have an attorney helping with this process? So we went through with that, and yeah, my dad ended up getting an attorney, but his attorney's really slow, and now it's been going on for years. So I don't know where it actually stands now, but that was the main issue. I did the initial appeal, and I'm pretty good with as far as contract law, all that stuff goes. Mm -hmm. And I appealed it my my solid. I mean, it was like a thirty page mm -hmm. appeal, just going through picking apart every little thing that they said going through the terms condition everything and they just flat out denied it yeah i mean it's an unfortunate situation the reason why they said within two years is because the insurance company has two years to do their mm -hmm. homework after two years like for example i can get a, a life policy lie on every question on there get it approved mm -hmm. if i survive for two years and then after two years something happens to me the insurance company now is obligated, depending on the state you're in, in most states, the, they have to pay out that claim now because they passed up that two-year contestability period. Mm -hmm. so, See, that's where I thought that it was kind of unfair because he's been with them for way longer than two years. The yeah, yeah. thing is, is that he hit 26 years of age. Yeah. And I think within 60 days, I, I can't remember the exact dates, but it was like within 30, 60, 90 days of turning 26 and hitting that threshold. He got notification like, hey, you've got to reapply, mm -hmm. blah, 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 you know, fill out this application and uh, it's going to spin off into your own policy. Same insurance company, same coverage, but he had to transfer it from the, the plan with my father to his own individual plan. And that's what they use as the trigger to mm -hmm. deny the payment. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah. And and unfortunately speaking, like insurance companies have, you know, they, they figure out ways to to save on claims if they mm -hmm. can get out of it. Um, oh, everybody does. I mean, yeah. I understand how that goes exactly. Mm -hmm. But okay. Yeah, no, I was just wondering that um, based upon some of the things that you were saying there. So I guess on the next topic I wanted to jump into was tax deferred growth. I think mm -hmm. everybody loves when they don't have to pay taxes mm -hmm. or at minimal if they can defer the taxes okay mm -hmm. so for doing that what um i mean what tips do you have for for you know small to medium sized businesses or you know younger professionals people out there to be able to defer as much tax as they can yeah, that's a, that's an amazing question. Taxes are a huge Thank problem, you. especially for business owners. Taxes are a really big problem. Um, and there's a lot of, I think, leverage that some business owners might have as far mm -hmm. as deductions, expenses. That usually people become business owners because on the, there's right. some tax advantages to that, but it doesn't mean that you don't have to pay any taxes. You still have to pay taxes. especially. That's why I incorporated the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to take advantage of those... Um, 
tax savings that uh, mm-hmm. that you just can't get, you know, doing it as a sole proprietor mm-hmm. as easy, I think. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're limited to deductions and things that you can claim when you're just 1099 contractor only, a sole proprietor, uh, as yeah. opposed to being like an S-Corp or a C-Corp or LLC. And of course, with the guidance of your, your tax professional. Um, yep. And I, I think that one thing that accountants focus on, or a lot of a lot of business owners and accountants focus on, is on a year to year basis. How do I save money every single year? And yeah. eventually, it catches up because you start running out of deductions, and your accountant says, "Hey, you know, it's been three years of you claiming this. You got to stop, or you have to. You reach certain limits." But what if there's a way where you can kind of have it, you know, just tax deferred, like almost indefinitely, and then when you take the money out you are uh, in the 0% tax bracket now. So you can take that money out without paying taxes on it. And the way to do that is by converting over from a pre-tax situation to a post-tax tax situation. So in other words, mm-hmm. you take your income, you pay taxes on it today at today's rate, which I think the highest tax bracket today is about 37%, which is relatively right. low compared to his- historical rates. Right. So you pay taxes on it now while it's on sale. And then put it somewhere that's going to grow tax deferred. Oh, interest. On sale. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> taxes on sale right now in the United States. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we pay taxes on it now, put it somewhere that tax deferred earns interest and dividends tax deferred. It's going to grow. And then when we take it out, it's in the 0% tax bracket now. We don't pay taxes on it because we already paid taxes on it before. And because we're utilizing this strategy, the, the whole life insurance strategy or dividend paying, utilizing dividend paying whole life insurance. And under current tax law, this is how it works. It grows tax deferred. And if you use uh, post-tax dollars to fund it, meaning you pay taxes on it first, you can take that money out in the later years without having to pay taxes on it. Of course, mm-hmm. it's something you want to consult with your tax professional, but this is how it works in, as far as in, in general sense, uh, huge tax savings when you utilize it this way. So imagine having the ability to kind of take money from not having to constantly deduct every single year, because every mm-hmm. time you deduct money off in your business, that just means spending more money. You know, you right. might, for example, upgrade your software that you have to spend money on that. You upgrade new technology, you have to spend money on that. Upgrading with hiring new employees, you have to maintain those employees now. So deductions are good, like short term, but it doesn't mean that you just burn that money and not, never have to look at it again. You have to kind of maintain what you bought now. That's why the government has these tax deductions in place because they know that, all right, the government will say, all right, you're not going to pay us $10,000. So go out and hire people and buy software and do different things like that because they know that you're going to provide jobs and they're going to pay sales taxes. And, you know, it's just a revolving door uh, of paying more money out, which is what the government wants to stimulate the economy. But we Mm -hmm. still have to think where does our money live? Where does it live and how does it grow without constantly have to worry about the tax burden behind it? And the utilization of dividend paying life insurance can help with that, tremendously help with that in the sense of growing it and and being able to access it via loans and and via withdrawals without having to pay taxes on them if it's properly structured from the beginning. Okay, so one question is that we try not to get into a lot of... um, the 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 political side yeah, yeah. of things at all but we do discuss when there's possible regulations or stuff like that that is relevant to the discussion now there is you know one party out there that does seem that they actually want that other side to be taxable in mm-hmm. the future do you think that that is something that is a potential risk that 5 10 15 years from now there could be taxes on that other side and should you be operating a little bit with the mindset uh you know that hey this could be taxed eventually one day the rules could change halfway through this yeah you're absolutely right the rules could change the good thing about usually typically with about like laws that are uh, or situations where people are grandfathered into them like even Mm -hmm. if for example you were utilizing the strategies and then the laws came out afterwards in the future, like 10 or 15 years from now, they can't go back and make you pay taxes on the growth now and and the the withdrawals because you already pay taxes on it going in. So so number one, do I think that changes could happen? Yes, of course. Congress Mm -hmm. and the IRS can write whatever they want and that could change. Unfortunately. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) and and this is why you need to talk to a CPA every year because there's, there's changes and they know how to like, they know how the system works. So yeah, obviously, yeah, they can change. And then I think like number two, um, that they could change, but within certain parameters, it has to be logical. Like for example, why is a 401k tax in retirement? The reason why it's taxed in its entirety is because you didn't pay taxes putting money into it. 
That makes right. sense, right? It was you pre-tax. defer taxes, you, you deduct the taxes on your taxes every year, putting it into this pile of cash. Now, when you go to access this pile of cash, you have to pay taxes on it. And mm-hmm. then vice versa on the whole life insurance policy side, you pay taxes already on that money. The, the government already got their money. You're going to put it into the policy. It's going to grow. So for them to tax that again, I don't know. It, it just sounds like double taxation. Uh, and But it's possible. Yeah, I, but they, I mean, there is definitely some members of Congress today that are talking about that. I think they were talking more that going after medium to higher income thresholds with that stuff. But Mm -hmm. who knows? This stuff kind of grabs the legs of their own. And as a nation, we are facing, what, uh, well over $20 in Mm -hmm. debt, I believe, right? So who knows what they decide to do in the future? Because that is something that eventually will have to be tackled. I mean, Mm -hmm. you can't just live with that bubble, I think, forever. Mm -hmm. Um, So... I guess one other question that I have, because we do got to get start getting um, wrapped up. I mean, I, I think you built an amazing case. First off, I mean, this has been incredible. You've given us so much information in such a short time on so many like really diverse financial topics. Um, what would you say would be the best advice you could probably give? Uh, I, I think the show, I mean, they have a, a lot of small business owners that watch your show. I know because they reach out to me to come onto the show. Uh, but we also have a lot of younger executives. Mm-hmm. And when I say young executives, I don't necessarily always mean the age. I just mm-hmm. mean maybe, you know, they're in their mid 30s or mm-hmm. mid 40s. They're doing a career transformation and they're just starting to get into higher tiers of money that they've always dreamt up. What would be your top advice of the that type of audience out there uh, as for you know as some of the money moves that they they should definitely make? Yeah, so um, kind of general advice: keep that money. So whatever you're making, keep it. Figure out ways to keep it. Mm-hmm. Don't just earn it and then spend it all. Uh, have you heard of the? I made that mistake. <laughs> the golden uh, handcuffs. No, no. What's that? It, it's I've heard of it, but I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's where you make a lot of money. Like, for example, mm-hmm. you're an executive, you make, you know, a half a million dollars a year, but you live in a really big house, you have really nice cars, you buy really nice stuff, and you go on vacations, and you've kind of built this lifestyle that's really expensive. So and- I'm going to tell you, that's why I always <laughs> went in sales. And it's funny, because yeah. I mean, I have like, 10 less Paul guitars I'm looking at right now and stuff. But the thing is, I always went in sales because it's Kind of like that's why I'm in sales. That's why yeah. I have a tech degree. I didn't yeah. go on the business side, you know, the, the development side of things because they make really good money. But yeah. it's like, no, I'm going to be in control how much I make. If I could sell more, I want to get paid more. So for me, it was like, okay, well, the debt's getting up a little high. I guess I got to yeah. sell more. And yeah. it was always more of a. It's an easy. It was always an easy answer. Just sell yeah. more, you get more money. Yeah. And there you go. And that's one of the things I used as a motivators in my life. Now that I'm, you know, getting a little bit older up there, 37, I guess I'll be 38 in, in a month. But uh, now I'm like, you know, carrying all this debt when I've paid like $2,000 <laughs> <in> interest <laughs> is not good. So I started making some severe financial mm-hmm. moves to really cut that down. And it's great because over the last year, I probably cut it for maybe $2,000 a month just in interest payments I was doing, probably well under half. I, I haven't calculated okay. it up since my last moves in Mar- uh, in February, but um, I think it's probably sitting around 800 right now, mm-hmm. um, which which is way better off than where I was. But um, yeah, I, I, I definitely know the golden handcuffs. I have mm-hmm. that myself. Yeah, exactly. You just build this lifestyle where you're kind of just working for all your stuff. You're just yeah. kind of like, and, and I think that's a big, like, you know, not just in your situation, a lot of people are in your situation. Um, mm-hmm. And I think one way to de- de- deter from that is to have a way to kind of just keep your money growing no matter what. And you can access it too. It's not locked up somewhere that you can't touch it. You can access it. Right. And when you do access it, you're not withdrawn from the principle. You're borrowing right. against it. So you're always compounding your money. You know, no matter what, you're always compounding your money. Okay. Okay. Well, that's some uh, great advice. I definitely love that yeah. think on yourself concept, man. So, yeah. sorry, this has been, like I was saying, man, this has been amazing. 
Tell me, how can people digitally, please note, I'm saying digitally, yeah. stalk you? Where can they find you? Oh, yeah. Okay. So one thing, the best way is our website. It's finassetprotection.com, F-I-N, assetprotection.com. From there, it will take you to LinkedIn and to other areas we're on. And actually, just to help out, you know, to kind of give the audience more context mm-hmm. about this concept, I'll give them a free copy, a free ebook. Um, it's called Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson Nash. If they reach out to us at finassetsprotection.com, I'll send them a free copy of them. No need to schedule an appointment yet. If you want to just read the book first and then see if it's a good fit, that's that's fine. Just reach out to us at finassetsprotection.com and I'll send you a free copy of that ebook. Okay, that sounds awesome. And as everybody knows, it doesn't matter if you're on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Deezer, Stitcher, I can, whatever app you're using to consume this awesome interview, it will, in, down below, in the description, look at all the details. You'll see the link to the website. Get your pre book. Sorry, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on, man. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Perfect. Cheers. Wow, that was an awesome chat with Terry, right? First, y'all know the routine. If you found this interview helpful, if it sparked those warm and fuzzies, do me a favor, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Okay, or if you really want to do this a solid, okay, share this out to your network. Help other people that are trying to grow personally, professionally, grow their businesses. Help them find Shark Bite Biz two times a week. Yeah, two times a week. We bring some of the biggest, best minds around in the business community to talk about what they're doing. Share this out to your community. Let's grow this Shark Bite Biz community. Now let's get back to our kick butt guest, Sari. Another successful career transformation on the show. I think what I feel like he he ended up doing like a natural path, a career growth, a moving the next step up the ladder. What I love is how Sari broke it down for us and explained the differences in the sales cycle between financial planning and how it's a much more complex and longer sales cycle than something like health insurance. It's really good stuff. And I really love that side-by-side comparison he did for us. And it was an awesome high-level view. So, hey, thank you for that, Sari. Now, the bank on yourself concept. That's a pretty gnarly concept as far as the dividend paying life insurance goes. Being able to take a loan out against yourself on the equity on the policy itself. And to me, that was mind blowing. I've heard like fragments of stuff like this before, but I've never had somebody put it right there on a silver plate and be like, here, David, take this. And, you know, I I really just didn't have a full understanding or a real good, solid idea about this. So I also appreciate, as I'm sure you do as well, Sari, taking the time to really fully explain the difference between all these different types of life insurance policies and what they mean for you and your wallet. To wrap up, some solid advice from him in regards to deferred tax. We have a saying on the show, and I've said it a kabillion times, okay? Keep one eye on the future and keep one eye on the present. Decisions that you make today will affect you tomorrow. You have to live in the now, okay? You cannot forget about that. You have to pay your bills today, okay? However, the decisions and how you make the decisions will, as Sari says, will catch up to you eventually, So remember that as you plan out your tax strategy and your financial future for the years to come, there are smart ways to defer your taxes and get things for the lowest tax possible. That's why you need to talk to somebody like Sari and some accounting experts and people like that. The really, these people bring you the value of helping you get that plan that is legal. Same thing, you know, you always see in the news, all these millionaires and billionaires that barely paid any tax and all this money. Well, they're not doing loopholes. And the reason I say they're not doing loopholes is guess what? If it's in the law, they're not doing a loophole. They're actually doing the law, just that they have the right resources to take advantage of those pieces of the law. And that's exactly what somebody like Sari is able to bring to the table for you know, people like you, people like me that aren't in the multimillionaire or multi-billionaire status yet. So question of the day, 
What do you think about the bank on yourself concept? Leave a comment down below on YouTube. I would love to hear what you all think about this. Uh, to me, I, like I said, it was mind blowing because finally I had someone piece it all together and really give me knowledge about this for the very first time. Do you want to be on the show? This is an amazing show to be on. I love having people. My microphone's not always messed up during the interview, so don't worry. Uh, shoot an email, interviews at sharkbitebiz.com. Remember, you can join Shark Bite Biz on YouTube, $3 a month to become a baby shark, or go to deadhousecoffee.com, use code SHARK, get 20% off your order, and all those proceeds directly help this channel, Shark Bite Biz, grow to be bigger and better. I'm David Strasser. This is Shark Bite Biz. We'll see you all next episode. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Shark Bite Biz. We hope you got some insightful info from this podcast. Be sure to subscribe to us through your favorite podcast app and visit us on the web at www.sharkbitebiz.com. How has business changed for you in the 20s? Email us at podcast at sharkbitebiz.com so you can join us and share your story.